If you were here last Friday, we had a, um, we saw a great Robert De Niro movie for uh, college uh, movie night, and you thought we only watch uh, artsy, religious things. This is a religious movie, and uh, unbelievable that uh, Robert De Niro is in there, and our young college kids, some of them had no idea who Robert De Niro was. That's how old Robert De Niro is, <laughs> and how old we are. And they said, uh, when, they, when we uh, reminded them, it, you know, I'm sure Rowell would have cried, when we reminded them who Robert De Niro was, um, all they can think of is the newest movies of Robert De Niro, you know, the ones where he played some old guy and some, um, uh, the intern and all these other things. They have no idea that Robert De Niro is the godfather and all the other things. But, but we were trying to educate them. But uh, we were also, um, and don't worry, Brian, I'm not going to say the word. We were also saying some GRE type words that uh, I'm not going to say right now. Uh, one of Pastor Jay's favorites. But uh, there's, there's a, a, a major or a field of study in, in college, or in, I'm sorry, in education, that deals with the study of birds. Does anyone know what it is? Very good, ornithology. Birds, yes. Not ornithology, like us in Ernie and birth, but ornithology, as the study of birds. And um, there's a, an or ornithology class in the college, and there's a, there's a reputation for this class, because it is the study of birds. I mean, really, who studies birds? This, did anyone here take Ornithology 101? I wish. You wish? Oh my gosh, someone actually wants to be in that class. But um, uh, it's the study of birds. And, and, and this reputation for the, for, for the study of birds is one of the, the reputation is it's one of the most difficult classes in the curriculum. Uh, and in this college where, where, where I'm, what I'm talking about, and um, I'm not going to tell you which college, there is an extremely difficult professor who actually teaches ornithology. In the Philippines, when we have, um, when we have very difficult professors, they are known as what? Terrors, right? That's what we call, oh, is that a terror teacher? I don't know if, if that's how you call it here too. Um, but, but in the Philippines, when you go to college and, you, and there's, there's a bunch of professors who teach one class, uh, certain different classes, or whatever, some of them, when they're difficult, when they're extremely difficult, they're known as terrors. But ornithology is a required class. And so the, 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 the students in this college had to take this class where there's, um, there's this test at the end of the class where they, um, that it, it, it has, it, uh, the, the final test is a big chunk of their final grade. So for the final test on the stage were five different cages, and, but the cage was covered. And so they could not see the feet, they could not see what kind of bird it is. All they can see are the feet and legs of the birds. And so the professor, the terror one, says, here's the test. You can see that there are five birds on the stage and they're all covered except for their feet and legs. And this is the final test. You must tell me the identity of each of those five birds by looking only at their feet and legs. Well, everyone had studied long and hard, but no one anticipated that they have to study the feet and legs of the birds. And so all, everyone was sweating. Everyone, everyone was trying to remember something. Uh, you've, you've had final tests like that where you studied for the test, but, but the test that was given to you is nothing. I should tell you the story of one of my, uh, one of my, uh, one of my classes in, I don't, I'm, probably, I'm sure I've told you, I've told everyone else. This has nothing to do with the, with the, with the message, but uh, I had a test, well, I was going through a test in Old Testament history, in seminary, in Ohio, and there's a big chunk of, there's a sentence, and I'm sorry, there's a question at the end of the test where you're required to, to put on a full-on essay. I have no idea what the answer was, I don't even remember what the question was, but it's one of those things where I'm sweating, and I didn't know what to do. And at the same time, by the way, I spent the whole night, I didn't sleep, studying from this test, but not for that question. And so I was falling asleep, I was sweating, I didn't know what to do, and I started writing something. I, you gotta write something for the test, right? So I started writing. I think I fell asleep in the middle of the question, 
that when I actually woke up, you kind of woke up a little bit and looked at my, my, the, end, the back of my test. This is grad school, Old Testament history, and this is what I wrote in answer to the question that was given there. I want to know what love is. I hope you will show me. I want to know what love is. What is the, the, Tim, what is the end of the thing? I want you to show me. I want to know what love is. I hope you will show me. Something like that. I know you will show me. Thank you, Roel. Yes. Um, uh, so uh, and my Old Testament professor also looks like an Old Testament professor. He's very old. And so I'm sure if you read that. So I had to take the eraser and started erasing. Um, in other, and, and to make the long story short, at the end of that, at the end of that, uh, at uh, the end of that uh, class, I think I got a C. Well, I got a B or something, B minus. So it was horrible. But but back go, going back to the story. So everyone had studied long and hard, but no one has an had anticipated that question on the test. And finally, after all that, one student stood up and said, "This is extremely hard, and actually is ridiculous. This this the craziest test." I have ever seen, and you're the worst professor in this whole school. And so he continued, I quit. I'm out of this class. I'm not going to take this test. And he turned and walked away and walked toward the door in the back. The professor said, just a minute, young man. Who are you? I demand your name right now. And the young man stopped. Took a, long, long, uh, took a long look at the professor, and then pulling up both of his pant legs, he said, you tell me. This question has always been asked of us. Maybe we don't pull, out our, our, our pant pull up our pant legs, but we are always being asked, well, who are you? Tell me more about yourself. Not just what's your name, but who are you? Tell me more about yourself. If you've been to job interviews, you always know that you, also, you should know that this is the first question always asked of you, right? Tell me more about yourself. Um, the past year, I've been going through interviews for the, for the Department of Corrections, and I've been to four of them. On the fourth and last one, when the, when the panel asked me, welcome, Ms. Ilano, can you tell us more about yourself? I almost said, you tell me. You've got my resume, you've got my application, why do you have to ask me? You already know who I am. You already know what I've done. You know my, my background, my education and experience and all that. But people still ask you because they want to hear from you. They want to know if you, uh, uh, what kind of behavior you are and how do you explain yourself to them. Are you, who are you? You know, do you say, I'm a survivor? I'm a victim? Not just what my name is what your name is, but I'm a survivor, I'm a victim, and if you're into Michael Jackson, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I mean, do you, do you say that? And it's easy to say also that I'm a Christian. I'm a blessed son of God, or a child, uh, daughter of God. I am forgiven, I am redeemed. After Jesus left the earth, I'm sure one guy in particular had this question for himself. Now that I know Jesus, this guy is saying, what does that make me? And Jesus answered Peter's question, and he told him to write this in, in his letter. So I want you to go to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Many of you know this very, very nice verse. Many of you have this um, uh, memorized in your heart. Maybe some of you even have this as a memory verse of a life verse. But you know, this, it's, it's always fun to say this verse because it's a bit... Um, it's a bit crazy. Let me just say that. The words of this text, I think, it's a bit, it's a bit funny um, to the point of, of not just funny, funny, but, you know, humorous funny. That's, that's what it is. So 1 Peter 2, verse 9, Peter is speaking this, but this is what the Lord has told Peter to say. Who are you? And here is the answer. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful, wonderful light. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Is this how we view ourselves? If you call yourself a Christian, if you call yourself someone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ, is that how you view yourself? I am a chosen person. And I'm going to make the singular. I am a royal priest. Think about that. I live in a holy nation, or I'm from a, ho a holy nation. I am one of the people belonging to God, or maybe you can even say, I belong to God, that I may declare the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's an important question. You're not going through an interview. It's actually uh, better and more important than an interview. Who are you? How do you look at yourself? And if you don't answer these questions honestly and biblically, you will be an unhappy person. You see, the question is being asked not by someone else, but it's being asked by yourself. Ask yourself, who am I? And if we don't answer this question, this question honestly and actually biblically, if you keep answering the question, because you're not prepared for it, even though you studied the whole night, you will keep answering, I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. That's how we're going to answer it. But if you don't know the answer, and so if you don't know the answer to this question, if I don't know the answer to this question, and I don't know how to answer it honestly and biblically, I will be a very unhappy person. In fact, I'm not just going to be unhappy. I think I will drink too much. I will drink, I, will, I think I will eat too much. I already do that. Or I will eat too little. Or, or I will work too much. Or I would shop too much. I will try to please people too much. Or blame all these people all together. I will blame my mom. I will blame my dad. I will blame my parents. I will blame my, blame my family. Because I am not happy with who I am. Because you are not going to be happy with who you are. In this one verse, there are five descriptions of who we are. And this is kind of sort of like our resume or our job application, but actually it's more than that. Because if we know this, the person asking us, which is ourselves, doesn't have to go, well, I already see that in your resume. No, it goes beyond that. In this one verse, there are five descriptions of who we are that can make a huge difference, not in the lives of other people, but in our own life. You are a chosen people, chosen. If you go through the, the lunch line today, you will see at the end of the lunch line a, a paper bag with persimmons coming from, this is not stolen from your neighbor's tree, right? This is from your tree, from Chris's tree. And so when we get, when we, I, and I think I also heard that there's some other fruit there, but anyway, I saw the persimmons today. And, and when you think about looking at a tree of persimmons, you choose them, right? You don't just go, okay, I'm going to shake the tree and let everything that comes out, I'm going to bring to church. I'm going to bring and give to everyone. You actually sit there and you go, and I'm assuming Albert, uh, Chris's dad, if he's the one who picked it up, will be very choosy or be very picky about the kind of fruits that he has to get because it has to be what? Right. It has to be ready to eat. And so he's looking at that and I'm going to choose the right fruit. Exactly the same word. You are a chosen people. You are picked by Jesus, picked by God. God chose you, looked at the tree and said, this one, this one, this one, this one. This brings many visions of high school to me. Whenever, I don't know about you, maybe for you too. When someone says, you are a chosen people. When you go through high school, you guys remember high school? That could be hell for you if you had a bad high school, and that could be, have been heaven. But for me, there were days, especially when it's PE time, that it was not very nice to me. But you know, because this is when, this is when people start choosing you either to be in their team or to be their friend. And when you don't get chosen, the huge pressure is on you because you have to belong. Am I the only one speaking this way? Or this is true with everyone, right? If some of you who remembered high school, some of you who finished high school, high school, hopefully some of you who went through high school. But you know, this is the huge pressure is on us because this is based on popularity. 
This is based on the things that you, uh, you, how you look at, how you sound like, and that's how you're going to be picked for the volleyball game. And that is why however much and however hard uh, Kuya, Kuya Robert tries to teach me volleyball, I don't know volleyball. I don't like volleyball because I remember when I was in high school, I never get chosen for volleyball. Nobody liked me for volleyball. Why? Because I don't know how to play it. And so that's always been when it's volleyball time. I wish I could just melt and run away to the store across the street. I don't know where I'm going. But you know, but here's the question for this. Here's the situation for, the, for, for, for what we have here. In high school, you are popular and so people choose you. But not on this one. This one is not based on popularity. Not because of your race, it has nothing to do because of your religion or creed or upbringing or skill or morality or color or education or any other qualification. God just chose you. And don't even try to say this is why God chose you and God chose that person and not that person because we don't know anything about it. It's all God saying that I have chosen you. I don't know why. I don't know why, but he chose me. He chose you. Paul in Ephesians said, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. There was nothing that made you more valuable than others. Just because you've been in this country long enough, that doesn't mean you're more valuable than others. Just because you've been a Christian longer, that doesn't make you more valuable than others. Just because you go to church more than others, doesn't mean you are more valuable than others. You didn't earn or deserve it or meet any conditions to get it. God's choice of you happened before you were born. You have been chosen to have eternal life. This irresistible grace that God has given us has come to us and you have been unconditionally. What does unconditional mean? What's another word for that? No, I'm sure my mother will say no conditions. What does unconditional say, uh, uh, mean, translate to Tagalog? Anyone? No more Queen Marlo to tell me what it is. Unconditionally. Without conditions. Okay, I'm just going to go back to that, to whatever my mother said. <laughs> Without any conditions, there's no specific requirement for it. We don't know what that requirement is. Only God knows. You have been chosen. Think of that. Chosen unconditionally. I don't, I don't expect you to come to your first interview or to your fu uh, future interviews and say, can you tell us more about yourself? I am a chosen person. But yes, you can say that. But you are, he said, a royal priesthood. Priesthood. Something that you have to get in, something you have to qualify for, something that you need to have in order to, be, uh, to belong to. Jesus took that requirement and said, okay, you are in. Not only chosen, but belonging to royalty. Not just any other group. Not just a volleyball group or team. You're actually belonging to some sort of royalty. You are his child. You have royal blood flowing through your veins. And then that made you get into priesthood. You mean I'm a priest? Yes, you are. He, and then probably not the way we think of priests but you belong to the royal priesthood. He has made us his kingdom and his priests who serve before God his Father. I now have, from Revelation, there's, 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 there's something that says there that I now have immediate access to God. I don't need another human priest as a mediator. That's who you are. God himself provided the one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, no, you guys are in. You are in the royal priesthood. And now I have an active role in God's presence. Not only are you accepted into something, you have a role to perform. Not just, oh, get, great, I get a sticker. No, you get a sticker, yes, that you belong, but you also come with a job description that you have to do something. I don't just twirl, twirl my thumbs doing nothing. I now can minister in the presence of God. That's what a priest is. In fact, we are never out of God's presence. I'm never in a neutral zone. I am always in the court of the temple. Jesus picked me to be in. Jesus picked you to be in. Jesus let us in. Not only 
chosen, not only belonging to the royal priesthood, but you are a holy nation, he said. I'm not just the run-of-the-mill person in the world anymore. I have been set apart for God. I exist for God. And since God is holy, I'm holy. I share that character. We all share that character. I share his character. For you are a holy nation to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the nations of the earth to be his own. Now you can always, um, um, you can always debate this and argue this and say, well, he was really talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about you. He's talking about you. He's talking about you and me. The Lord has chosen us out of all the nations of the earth to be his own. Deuteronomy says this world holy means to be cut, to be cut above. You go to a Korean barbecue, and if you go to one of the Korean barbecues in Koreatown, well, many of them in, in Koreatown in Los Angeles, they have, a, they have an all-you-can-eat menu where it's like around $65 per person. And you're sitting there like, what's the difference between this $65 menu and the $20 menu at Jen? What's the difference? They serve Kobe beef. It's a different kind of beef. It's a cut above everything else. And so this is what the Lord is saying. You are cut above the crowd. When I do not act in a holy way, I'm acting out of character because I'm supposed to be a cut above. Of, uh, when I live in an unholy way, I contradict the fundamental nature of being a cut above. I am not top round. I'm Kobe beef. So are you. You're a cut above. And when we live in an unholy way, because he said you belong to a holy nation, you, are, you and I are acting out of character. When we live in an unholy way, we are contradicting the fundamental nature of being someone who belongs to a holy nation. Of who I am, of who you are in God's sight. Jesus picked you apart. Jesus picked me apart from everyone else. Pick me out, I'm sorry, not picked apart. Jesus let me in. Jesus sets me apart. And then of all the five characteristics of who I am, of who you are, of who everyone is, these last two are my favorites. The, the second to the last is this. But you are a people for his own possession, he said. So I'm going to ask um, Hannah to put back to verse 9. Maybe you've forgotten what he said there. Second to the last um, uh, uh, characteristic is that you are a people for his own possession, a people belonging to him. Now that's very different from what he has said a while ago. I'm sure you've noticed that people like to show off things that they have that's their own. You know, you may have a famous athlete's autograph, you know, proudly displayed, or you know, when uh, I remember Imelda Marcus, she's still alive, right? Yes. Uh, when Imelda Marcus was being interviewed, um, there was a, a, an actual Monet painting on the left and an actual Picasso on the right. I am not kidding you, these, these are not, these are not uh, prints. <laughs> They're actual Monet's and Picasso's and that's the way God is with us. I'm not saying that God is like Imelda Marcus, but really, he's showing off what he has. That's the way God is with us, with his children. We are a special possession. We are the ones he aims to spend eternity with. Deuteronomy once again says, And the Lord has declared this day, you are his people, his treasured possession. You're a Monet. You are a Picasso. His treasured possession as he promised in a way, you know, we are refrigerator art. Every time I go to Fiji's place and Ryan's place, I always see whatever small fry did that morning. It's up on the board. It's up on the refrigerator. Because he is happy to show it off to everyone else or maybe it was his parents that put it there i don't know but in a way we are refrigerator art jesus picked you jesus let you in jesus set you apart jesus shows you off and finally he called you not only to be picked to be to be chosen to be let in to be set apart to be showed off but actually he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Not only is, not, is it now a, a, um, a, a group of people, now there's a place for us. There's a purpose for us. When teams show off their number one draft pick, those of you who are into sports, or I remember the time that they showed off uh, um, Shaquille O'Neal coming to the Lakers many, many years ago. They celebrated the arrival 
of, of, of Shaq, and they hold a press conference. Not just so the world can know what this guy looks like, but in the press conference, the, the, the team declares what this person can do. When they pick the number one draft picks, they always put them in a, a, a press conference, and not only does it say that, you know, what, what this, for who this person is, but what this position, what he, this person is going to bring into the team, what this person is going to do to the team. The reason we paid millions of dollars for this guy is that so that he can be a defensive presence. Defensive presence, and this is exactly what they said about Shaq. The reason we paid millions of dollars for this guy is so that he can be the defensive presence we never had before, and it's true. And Shaq did his work, did his job. Back to our verse today, what he's saying to you is that I have brought you out of darkness into a marvelous light. I didn't just bring you and say, now have fun, good luck, I'm going to go. No, I'm going to bring you out and put you somewhere put you somewhere where you're going to be a marvelous light. We all know Jesus said you are the light of the world, right? You are the lights. The spotlight is on you. You know, when, when, when we light up a garden, and I'm still waiting for the time I would have someone come and design the back of the stage where you're going to have lights that will have a spotlight. There's going to be a nice uh, conglomeration of, of colors so that it can bring a little, bit of, um, a little bit of beauty or creativity to the back and not just a, 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 a white you know, wall here. But it's like lighting up a garden. You've got the greens here, the blues here, the brighter there. Why? Because it needs to emphasize something in your garden. It needs to emphasize something here. God has taken a highlighter, a huge highlighter, and he starts highlighting you in bright yellow. We're all fluorescent yellow. God has been holding a press conference for you. Not just you can be lit up. Not just I can be lit up and emphasized and have a marvelous life so that we can what? So that we can declare the marvelous praises of him. Still up there. So that we can declare the marvelous praises of him. Pulled out, taken, set apart, chosen, Accept it into something for what purpose? If you want to understand a little bit more about purpose, Rick Warren, of course, is the author of Purpose Driven Life. And this is what he said in his book. You were made by God and for God. And until you understand that, life will never make sense. You were made for God and not vice versa. And life is about letting God use you for his purposes, not you using him for your own purpose. Wow. We can't really talk about who we are without talking about who he is. Isaiah 43, 21 says, The people whom I made for myself will make known my praise. Our identity is for the sake of making known him and his identity. God made us for who we are to show the people who he is. We proclaim his excellencies in our own church services we, without standing up here and preaching. You, you don't have to do that. You know, you do it by singing in all sincerity. Some of you lift up your hands, shouting his praise. We can proclaim his excellencies in our small groups, in our Bible studies, when we tell each other what God has done for us, when we share during Wednesday what the Lord has done for us for the week. We, we, we do that. We do that when we, when we can proclaim His excellencies at work even. And don't even think that the only place where you can proclaim the excellencies of God is just when you're working in a Christian school or a Christian organization or a Christian university. But, you know, if you work for the state, you work for the county, you cannot do that anymore. I disagree. You can proclaim His excellencies at work, at the gas station, at the grocery uh, stores, Wherever you are, we tell people what we love about God and why we think he is great. Just say a good word about Jesus and watch what he does. Five facts about who you are. You are chosen, you are accepted, you are set apart, you are shown up as a possession, and you are finally lit up. If you aren't enjoying these facts about who you are, it's not because you are beyond your reach, but because you are living below your privileges. You refuse, maybe, to believe that you are a, 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 a person that has been saved by the Lord. And therefore, you have his righteousness. Maybe we refuse to believe, I, I, I'm not good enough. 
Think about that, folks. Who did God save? You refuse to leave your old self and step into the light. And you've, ever, you've always felt, I'm not good enough. I'm not checking your confidence here, church. I'm not checking your skills. As a manager, as a nurse, not your skills as a manager, a nurse, an engineer, a teacher, a clerk, or whoever you are, a mother, a father, a housewife, a friend. Have you ever felt not good enough to be a follower of Christ? Folks, I do that every day. I do it every day. These things are true for every follower of Christ. We start feeling that we don't measure up. And then we have to remind ourselves, ourselves of the truth like this. When you and I are about to do something, and we, and we know it's not according to God's word and command, we need to stop and remind ourselves and remind ourselves well, thinking about who you are, who I am to God, and it will cut out my insecurity. I don't have to prove to you that I'm worth something because I know I am. Did you hear that? You don't have to prove to anyone that you are worth something because you are, because you know the truth. I know the truth. You know how much you're worth. You are God's number one draft pick. We never know how to express our faith. We never know how to share. Why? Because we don't have the confidence to begin with because we don't know who we are. We always hide behind the pastor. We hide behind Kuya Brian. We hide behind our uh, Sunday school teachers. We hide behind our Bible study teachers. You know, every time you, you, someone asks you, so, you know, what, what do you do? Who are you? You know, you pull out the uh, Pastor Jay's card and say, here, call my pastor. Here, here's the church that we go to. That's all I'm going to say. You know, you, you know we, we, or, or, or I'm going to say, oh, I'm going to give you a uh, Jesus film. So it'll be easier for you. Or if I, um, I'll, I'll make you sh- uh, see the passion of the Christ. We, behind, we, 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 we stand behind our tracks. You know those tracks? We go, you know, who are you? Well, I'll just give you a track. I won't say anything else. I'll just make you read it. I remember when I started teaching youth Bible study many, many years ago. I was reading, opinion, uh, you know, I was reading the book that I was teaching these young people, and someone yelled out to me, never mind what the author is saying. What do you say, Jay? <laughs> and and you know what, that was that, 30 years ago? And I've never, ever forgotten what that young man said. That young man is now married with kids, successful in life, but I remember that one question he had for me. Never mind what that book says, Jay. What do you say? From that time on, I realized people want to hear our conviction. What do you believe in? Not some tr- what some tract would say. Who am I? Leads directly to another question. Who told you that's, that's who you are? Not just the question, who are you? But someone else is going to follow up that question with this. Who told you you are that question? You are that person. Remember, Jesus said, you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness to be in his wonderful light. Let us pray and let us stand.